Welcome to the Recharge Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Brent Doty, and I'm joined by my co-host, and margaret Gonzalez. Hi, Anne margaret Hi. Today we have a special guest, Marcus Gary. Hi, Marcus. Hey, Brent. Hey, Anne margaret How are you today? Doing well, doing well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Looking forward to it. That's Chatting crazy. with you today about evapotranspiration. Yeah. So we've got some crazy words today, but we'll be explaining them all. Um, today's episode is all about eddy covariance towers and evapotranspiration, as Marcus said. So the title of the episode is E.T., not the alien. <laughs> so we are talking about E.T. today. That is evapotranspiration. We needed that catchy title to get people in, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Nobody phone home. <laughs> so, uh, Marcus, these are obviously very technical terms, but can you help our listeners understand what they mean and why are they are significant? Sure, absolutely, Brent. So I'm going to start with evapotranspiration because um, that is a, a compound word so we can break it apart into evaporation which most people are probably familiar with and transpiration which you may or may not be familiar with so evaporation that's um, water that's changing its state from the liquid state to the um, to the gas state so if you have water sitting in your cup in the hot sun all that water that goes uh, up into the atmosphere is evaporation so transpiration is similar, but this is a process in which water goes from the soils into the atmosphere through, uh, through plants. And so the metabolic processes of plants take that water and they transpire it and it comes out through their leaves as transpiration. And so evapotranspiration is the sum of those two um, uh, fluxes of water going from the cert land surface um, up into the atmosphere. And it's powered by the energy of the sun, both through both processes. So it's like it's soil evaporation and plant transpiration. Right. It could be soil evaporation. So water that's in the pores of the soils uh, can evaporate directly out. So the soils get hot and dry. Oh, okay. um, uh, that's because the, the water has evaporated out. And then uh, it's also water coming out of the soils through the plants is transpiration. And so that process is mediated through the uh, metabolic processes of the of the plants, so grasses, trees, shrubs, all those types of things contribute to transpiration. And that's like a part of the water cycle, right? It's Is one of the biggest thing? parts of the okay. water cycle, <laughs> but it's, it's also probably one of the largest components of the water cycle that nobody really knows yeah. because you can't see it. So things like precipitation and uh, river flows and creek flows, we can see that yeah. water moving and we can okay. see the water uh, falling as precipitation. But evapotranspiration, it's, it's kind of like the ghost of the water budget. And yeah. so it's always happening in the background. Um, it happens, uh, uh, those rates of evapotranspiration are much higher in the summertime than in the wintertime. And that's a function of both the sun's energy is less in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. So it can't evaporate uh, as, uh, as readily as it does in the summer. But also many uh, plants are inactive in the wintertime. So the transpiration process actually goes dormant in the wintertime. And so in the wintertime, um, there's a much uh, less potential for evapotranspiration oh, I see. than we see in the summertime. And how do we measure ET? What, how, how are those data collected? Right. So there are a number of ways uh, that we can uh, measure evapotranspiration or ET. And uh, in the title of, of today's podcast, uh, eddy covariance, and, and there's a, a technique that uses um, sensors that are mounted on a, on a tower uh, that we call um, eddy covariance. Um, and these sensors measure all the different um, parameters or, or um, observations that we see in the atmosphere and in the soil. So things like air temperature, relative humidity, um, wind speed, wind direction, uh, soil moisture, the solar energy from the sun going both downward into the ground and also radiating back up from the ground. So it takes all these different components um, of the energy budget mm -hmm. from the sun and, and it can calculate those. Um, uh, it's a really complex calculation. Uh, you know, it would take this whole desk to write out what's going on with all these variables. But, um, but what's unique about eddy covariance um, uh, estimates of evapotranspiration 
are the sensitivity of the instruments that we use. So for instance, wind direction. Well, we're not just looking at what direction the wind, is it coming from the north, the south, or the east, or the west? We're really looking at very high resolutions if that wind direction is going up or down um, and how that changes on very high frequency um, time steps. So we're not just saying, hey, you know, this hour the wind was five miles an hour out of the, you know, out of the north, which is the way you see it on a weather forecast. These sensors are measuring 10 times a second and giving an exact direction and magnitude of, of the of the wind speed. Wow. And that's where the term eddies come in. So as as wind moves across the land surface, it kind of rolls, kind of think of like a ocean waves, um, but these are um, air, air waves and, and those, uh, they create eddies. And so there's lulls and there's um, peaks um, of this wind energy. And that advective component of the wind energy uh, dictates um, all those molecules of water that have evaporated or transpired from the surface, which direction they're going. So that's one of the components. Um, there's also uh, solar uh, energy. And so, again, every 10 times a second, these eddy covariance towers are measuring the solar energy that's coming down from the sun and it's also coming back, uh, the, the, the energy that's radiating back up from the, from the ground. Um, and then uh, probably the coolest sensor that's on here that's, that's by the wind speed sensor are uh, gas laser analyzers. And so what makes this unique is it's taking direct measurements using a laser of the concentration of water vapor and carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. And so, again, taking a measurement 10 times a second along with all these other measurements. And um, so what this gives you is a very high-resolution picture of how much water is present in an area, which direction it's moving, how much solar energy uh, is available, and um, uh, how much CO2 is also um, uh, available uh, in these measurements. So, you know, 10, so th there's something like, I think, 30 different measurements that are made 10 times a second. So that's a lot of data. It's wow. a huge yes. amount of data. And so you can't just look at all of these individual parameters and say what's going on. And so the tower, or the eddy covariance tower itself has a, its own computer, like it says, on, onboard computer that takes all of those data. And then what we look at are 30 minute averages. Cool. So if you're, uh, if listeners out there, if you're thinking that this sounds kind of complex, uh, that's because it is. It is. But it is pretty <laughs> accurate. Um, so, Marcus, you've been with the EAA now for a long time, currently serving as our principal geoscientist. Um, I want to talk to you about a study that you did with eddy covariance uh, a few years back at Camp Bolas. I know we had an ET or an eddy covariance tower out there, and you were looking at ET. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and, and what those results um, indicated? Sure. And again, just, just for reference, the reason we are interested in ET is because it's a big part of the water budget uh, that we can't see. And so we have to quantify that and see how it fits into our other estimates of the water budget. In particular, at Camp Bullis, we were interested in studying what we call diffuse recharge. And so diffuse recharge um, is that component that just percolates down uh, from rainfall that goes down to the soils and into the rocks mm -hmm. and can potentially make it down to the aquifer. Karst aquifers are unique. They have two different types of recharge. They have the diffuse recharge uh, that we don't know as much about and then discrete recharge or, or point recharge, which happens in creeks and rivers. And a lot of times we think of that's where a lot of the recharge occurs. And, and that is where most, much of the recharge occurs in the Edwards. Um, so to understand this diffuse recharge in more detail, we had to know exactly what that water budget was of when rainfall falls into the ground and soaks into the soil, how much of it goes back up into the atmosphere is evapotranspiration. And so at Camp Bullis, we set up three different ET towers um, in three different vegetation zones. So we had one in a grassland, we had one in uh, what we called an open uh, oak savanna, so an area where there are big live oak trees that are kind of spaced out. 
And then we had some in a dense ash juniper forest. So these are three kind of typical um, vegetation types that we see throughout the hill country. And we wanted to see if there was a difference in the different vegetation types with rates to evapotranspiration. So does the trees transpire more water up through the year compared to grasslands or ash juniper and, and, and so on? And so we did the study for about three and a half years. Um, and what we found with these different vegetation types is there wasn't a big difference in bulk evapotranspiration when you looked at um, how much uh, water went back up into the atmosphere um, over the course of a year, it was about the same uh, in each of these three uh, zones. So um, knowing that, we could take the data from the towers and use those to, to calibrate um, estimates of evapotranspiration that are made through satellites. So there are satellites that are orbiting the Earth. NASA produces these really great data sets that we can use. And the nice thing about these satellite-based data sets is they cover you know, the entire globe, or in our case, you know, our entire region. Wow. Whereas a, an, an eddy covariance tower or an ET tower only collects data specific to that exact location. But what we can use those tower data um, to calibrate uh, and uh, those estimates that are made from satellites hmm. And we can get a bigger picture across the region on what evapotranspiration has um, across the whole area. And so with the Camp Bull study, what we did is we took, we were measuring the precipitation, the, the rainfall that, that fell, and we were measuring the amount of evapotranspiration that was going back up into the atmosphere. And so in some conditions, say in the summertime, where it's been kind of dry, kind of like it's been uh, this, this past summer, um, all the, the, the water that falls as rainfall and goes into the soils goes pretty readily back up into the atmosphere as, evapor uh, as evapotranspiration. And so it's not really available for aquifer recharge. Mm -hmm. So we have to get more and more water into those soils so it can percolate deeper down into the subsurface and hopefully eventually make it into the aquifer. And so... Um, uh, what we found out was, you know, there are very distinct patterns. And so if we, if we have a lot of rain, particularly a lot of rain in the uh, fall or winter or early spring months, when transpiration rates are lower, we have the potential to get more recharge uh, down. So there's a, a down into the aquifer. So that means there's a larger, uh, there is a, uh, in your water budget, there's a surplus of water, mm -hmm. There's more precipitation and there's evapotranspiration, so that surplus can make it down. Wow. Whereas in dry months, you have a deficit of water, and so you're not getting any recharge because all that water is just going right back up into the atmosphere. Wow. So it's like if it, you know how there's a conception or sometimes a misconception that if it rains and it's been dry for a while, it's like, oh, it's rained, like it's, but it's not making its way because it kind of needs to be saturated for the water to start going in there. Exactly right. Okay. You have to fill all those pore spaces up. And, and you think about it, all these plants are, have been like really parched and thirsty for water. They want to take a big drink yes. when that water finally, finally does fall. And so many times when we've been in, in dry conditions uh, like this year, we may need many, you know, rains of, you know, a few inches just to kind of satisfy that um, that previous deficit of water uh, in the water budget that the plants need, you know, the, the, the pore spaces in the rock have dried out, and you have to fill all those back up before the water can percolate all the way right, down. Right, before to the you aquifer. have any real recharge happening. That's right. And so if you've known, you know, if you've, we've had some rains, right, a few inches in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. But if you go out and look at your creeks in your backyard or the rivers, there's still not any water in them. That's mm -hmm. because that water is just getting held up in, as soon as it wow. falls to the ground. So, so Marcus, fast forward to today, and we have two eddy covariance towers measure, measuring ET. Um, one tower is located at the EAA Field Research Park, and the other is in our western region. Um, can you explain what a tower is and kind of for our audience uh, to give them a visual of like how it looks and how big it is, because I feel, I feel like we kind of haven't said that yet. And then sure. what is the purpose of having these two towers located in different areas in the aquifer region? Sure. So the towers um, uh, have to extend above the tree canopy. So I talked about those uh, eddy currents of, of, of wind uh, that are moving across the land surface. 
we want to have our sensors um, up above the the treetop or the tree canopy, so we're getting those uh, those currents as they move across the land surface, and they're not being obstructed by by surface vegetation. Um, so the tower that's in uh, at the field research park in Bear County um, is kind of on the eastern edge of our uh, of our area, uh, and then the one that's out in Uvalde County is out in the western edge of the area. Um, um, on the eastern edge, the, we have taller trees. We have oak trees, and so that tower is quite a bit taller. It's okay. about it's about fifty or sixty feet. Uh, it's a big scaffolding. Uh, it looks like scaffolding in a construction site, and it's got sensors that are attached to it at different heights um, uh, along the scaffolding. The tower that's out west um, is in a different vegetation type. So there's mostly mesquite trees, which are shorter, and so that's a smaller tower. It's only really? about uh, it's probably about twenty feet shorter than the one, um, and so. Um, you know, you you kind of um, customize the where the sensors are depending on what the vegetation type is. Makes sense. So we also are trying to characterize evapotranspiration patterns um, across our region, and the Edwards Aquifer is situated in kind of in a transition zone in Central Texas, where on the east we have, you know, a lot higher precipitation rates um, uh, compared to the west, and so. Whereas in the east, we may have an average precipitation value of, say, 32 or 33 inches a year. Out in Uvalde, it might be closer to 22 or 23 inches per year. And the vegetation is quite different. And so um, we have these towers kind of on either end, so we can use them as uh, calibration points, again, for those satellite-based data that may span the entire region. So we kind of have the endpoints uh, where we're collecting data, and we can compare that to the the data that are produced from the satellites to make sure that they are an accurate representation of evapotranspiration on a regional scale. Nice, that makes sense. And then that makes complete sense about them being the, the height of the vegetation. I didn't even think about that. Right, so mm-hmm. you don't want to be measuring just the wind swirling around <laughs> in your backyard, right? <laughs> you want to you want to try to get a picture of kind of where the you know which way the wind's blowing. And, and unobstructed from, from whatever's on the yeah. surface. Okay, that makes sense. So we, we kind of already talked about how ET fits into the water budget. Um, you know, in earlier podcasts, we had Thomas Marsalia and Matthew Rogers on here talking about land management and soil health at the FRP. So right now we have these land management practices at the Field Research Park, and we're trying to measure their effectiveness. Now, what role does ET play in that particular project? Sure, it all boils down to the water budget, and, and, and so these land management practices that, that we're experimenting with, um, the goal is to increase uh, infiltration um, uh, of water, hopefully eventually into the aquifer, but certainly um, into areas uh, that can benefit, uh, into the soils that can benefit the, the vegetation, maybe some uh, locally perched springs or things like that. So, you know... Evapotranspiration is probably the biggest component of the water budget um, besides precipitation. So just for reference, um, in eastern Bear County, as I mentioned, the average precipitation is around 32 inches a year. Average evapotranspiration, or that water that's going back up into the atmosphere, is about 28 inches a year. <laughs> so that's a lot. That's like a big part of the water budget. And so if you assume that all of your precipitation is just going down, you know, into the ground and staying there, that's not the case. You know, a large percentage of it just goes right back up into the atmosphere. And so if you're not accounting for that, it's just like your bank account. If you're not keeping up with how often you use your debit card you know, pretty soon you're going to get yourself into trouble Mm -hmm. because um, there's more going out than there is coming in. So um, we have to really accurately know what that water budget is. Um, And the challenge with these land management practices is we're we're having to figure out how to measure in fine detail what the benefits to a natural process that's really hard to measure by itself – and so um, what we have to do is we have to identify all of the different components of the water budget. You know, so all those debits and all those credits, right, all those inputs and outputs. And um, we have to be able to, you know, nail those down so we can identify what any particular activity would have on just one of those components. 
So what are some other possible avenues for research using these eddy covariance towers at the FRP and some implications for measuring carbon sequestration? Right. So evapotranspiration is really just a fundamental, um, you know, component of the water budget. And it's used by many, many people in, you know, who are interested in water. So groundwater models that are used to, um, to estimate the, um, the health of the aquifer, how much water, you know, what are the water levels in people's wells? What's the spring flow at Comal or, or San Marcos Springs? Um, and so these groundwater models, um, take inputs from the water budget and you know a lot of their inputs might be stream flow from a a a river um, uh, that's recharging the aquifer so we have stream gauges that measure that flow so i like to think of these um, eddy covariance towers are kind of like stream gauges for the water that's going back up into the atmosphere through evaporation or transpiration and so from a broad perspective uh, researchers that are uh, or planners or uh, you know, people that are using the water budget to understand um, how, you know, how to manage the, the aquifer will use these data to, um, you know, as kind of a, a core component. And so as a step to do that, we're working to standardize the data that we collect from, from these towers and put them uh, on a, a kind of in a, in a national framework called Ameriflux, which is basically eventually having these data available for researchers all over the country, all over the world to use, whether they're trying to understand the local effect, effects um, uh, of you know, on the Edwards aquifer, or maybe they're trying to find calibration points to run global climate models. And so these data would be, you know, just kind of thrown into the, you know, the, the big mix of data that are available to help people make decisions and, and, and create these hydrologic models. Right. Because that's all, that's what it's about, right? Like sharing knowledge, sharing data. Sure, we're all right? more efficient if we work together yeah. uh, and communicate uh, communicate well together. You mentioned carbon also. And, and so um, I mentioned the, the laser uh, gas analyzers that are part of these um, uh, eddy covariance towers. So they're actively measuring the carbon dioxide that's um, in the atmosphere. So and what direction that CO2 is going. So are the, are the plants consuming it and sequestering it down into the soils, or uh, is there more CO2 available uh, that's in the atmosphere? So the towers can be used to help quantify that flux of carbon with relation to CO2, because that's the, that's the, the form that carbon is that plants are exchanging with. And so um, uh, can directly use these eddy covariance towers also as another tool to understand what those effects of carbon sequestration in the soils would be. Incredible. Well, Marcus, uh, thank you for your time today, talking to our listeners all about eddy covariance towers and evapotranspiration and everything associated with that. We really appreciate your time today. Great. A lot of fun. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thanks. And for our listeners, if you have any questions about today's episode or any other questions related to the aquifer, please email us at rechargezone at edwardsaquifer.org, and we'll see you on the next one.